high quality research at the intersection of financial economics and macroeconomics. Woo's research focuses on asset pricing in connection with macroeconomics, corporate finance, labor economics, and capital markets research and accounting. His, his major contribution is the investment cap M, which provides a unified conceptual framework for understanding asset pricing anomalies. As its empirical implementation, the Q factor model is a leading workhouse war coast factor model in both academia and the investment and management industry. One chapter of his doctoral thesis, The Value Premium, won the Smith Freedom Prize in 2005. His academic research is featured frequently in prominent media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Shanghai Financial News, and The Economist. So Lou has around 15 papers in the top three finance journals and more than 20 top tier publications when you include the top econ and accounting journals. He has around 12,000 citations and this number is rising rapidly. So yesterday when I introduced Ronnie McKayley, I mentioned that I thought that Ronnie is one of the all time great finance academics. So Lou's much younger than Ronnie and I think he's well on his way to also becoming one of the all time great finance academics. What I particularly like about Lou is he's a passionate and driven researcher who relishes taking on the best in the business and usurping them. So today Lou is presenting on asymmetric investment rates and I'm very much looking forward to his talk. So just in terms of housekeeping, we'll have a presentation today of around 40 minutes followed by Q&A. So please ask your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom and we'll address these questions after Lou's talk. Lou, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phil. All right, let me share my screen. All right. Right. So thank you. Thank you so much, Phil, um, for inviting me to give this keynote. It's a great honor for me. So this is a new paper that we just circulated uh, last week. It's joint paper with Han Bai at UConn, Erica Lee at CKGSB, and Chen Xie at University of Cincinnati. So what we ask in this paper is that how, how to measure firm level fixed investment rate. To this end, we're going to build that data infrastructure for firm specific current cost capital stocks for the entire CompuStat universe. So after that is done, we're gonna ask what are the basic properties of firm level investment rate? And we're gonna characterize accurately the key properties, including the symmetry and the lumpiness of firm level investment rate. You might think that the investment rate is such a central concept in corporate finance and increasingly so in asset pricing. You would think the measurement issue has long been resolved. It's actually quite the opposite is true. It is largely resolved as we will see later at the aggregate level, but the firm level computes that variables is quite diverse. So we implemented the meta analysis, meta study. We looked at the top five finance journals. We're adding GFQ and the review of finance. Uh, in addition to the traditional three, uh, we looked at all the publications from the year 2000 onwards. We have identified in total 347 articles that contain in total 40, 40 different investment rates that have appeared in total 393 appearances. 393 times. And here is the frequency distribution of the all the 40 different rates. And we are ranking them in a descending order. You can see that the top three most used variables are CapEx over uh, total asset, CapEx over net PPE, and the total asset growth. The top three combined to account for over 60% of the uh, total appearances. At the lower, at the at the other end of the spectrum, we have 14 different variables that have appeared only once and five different investment rate variables that have appeared twice. And here is the list of 40 uh, different variables. Uh, these are all CompuStat item, uh, items. You see that um, uh, if you all combine them together and you ask, what about the, the, the basic moments? So in the left panel, we are plotting the mean investment rate in annual percent against cross-sectional standard deviation. You see that uh, it's very, very heterogeneous. The mean goes from 
3.4% per year all the way to 64%. The standard deviation goes from 7.1% all the way to 129%. And that outlier, let me see if I can go back. Right, that outlier is number 27, is CapEx plus acquisition from the cash flow statement scaled by PPNT. And if you if you if you ignore if you ignore, ignore that outlier, so this variable is, is still has a pretty high uh, average, which is 40%, the standard deviation, which is 62, 63%. And that's number eight. That's the variable that uh, um, Andre Concavus and Chen Xu and I were using in our 2020 RFS paper. So we are using uh, changing net PPE plus accounting depreciation scaled by net PPE as investment rate measure. So the lower end, the 3.4% mean is this net investment measure, CapEx minus depreciation scaled by uh, total assets. So the right panel, we're plotting skewness against serial correlation. Skewness is all positive. So all the distributions are uh, right skewed to various extents. But if you look at the serial correlation, it goes from 0.14 all the way to 0.66. And the higher end is CapEx over total assets. So I grew up in the macro finance uh, theoretical tradition. The serial correlation is the key moment that pins down the magnitude of adjustment costs. So what we can see from this uh, figure is that there's very little empirical guidance that can tie our hands in terms of calibrating our models. So we're going to try to uh, clean up uh, um, this mess a little bit. And the, the two red dots, bigger dot, bigger red dots are our measurement of current cost investment rate. Right, so that's what we do. The main data work is to construct a firm specific current cost capital stock for the entire CompuStat universe. So we can be, uh, so our data at the end of the day, we're gonna post all the data online. Hopefully people can find the data useful to use in their own work. So we're gonna, we're gonna measure investment as change in PPNT plus depreciation. So following a Hayashi paper and Inu, and we're gonna work with the Bureau of Economic Analysis, BAS industry specific price deflators and we have developed a meticulous CompuStat firm to make industry mapping, right? And, um, and this step alone is five months of work right there. We searched the literature, we couldn't find the ready to use mapping. So um, we went ahead and developed the mapping on our own. So it involves quite a bit of manual uh, work, manual matching, because in prior to 1985, we have to convert different versions of SIC codes to NAICS. And even after that, there's quite a few SIC codes uh, you must be matched manually. All the details, all the complexities are in Appendix B. So we're going to use that mapping to assign BA's industry level economic depreciation rates to the firm level. And then we're also going to take pain to uh, construct the initial value uh, for replacement cost of capital or current cost capital stock. So this step goes to the heart of our incremental uh, contribution. So let me spend some time to, um, to take a stock of what the current literature stands on perpetual inventory. So we implemented another meta analysis on, uh, we identified in total 33 prior studies at the firm level and only 10 are published in the first scope. The top five journals, finance journals from 2000 onwards as opposed to close to 400 papers. So it's pretty clear this literature, perpetual inventory literature has been outcompeted pretty badly. All right, so the 33 studies uh, started from Lindenberg and the Ross 1981 Journal of Business, Business is published all over the place, but it's being outcompeted very badly. Uh, I think uh, in a sense, the literature has, in, in our view, has a pretty good ideas, economic ideas, like economic depreciation, right? But uh, in a sense, uh, my read of the literature is that the literature suffers from uh, 
death by a thousand cuts in a sense of speaking. So each cut may not be deep enough, but combined together at the end of the day, people don't feel comfortable using uh, this set of construction. And again, only in 10 as opposed to 400 has been outcompeted badly. Most studies only use very small samples, mostly just manufacturing firms, investment is just capbacks, only single price deflator as fixed non-residential investment price deflator. Uh, you most, most estimates of uh, economic depreciation rely on Selinger and Summers double declining. Uh, so uh, we experiment a little bit and it's quite noisy. Uh, people oftentimes use in-sample average um, asset age. So in-sample constant, but is in real life, there's no constant, there's no in-sample average, because next year when we update our data set, it's effectively a uh, new observation coming in, come, will come in, it's effectively a expanding window, right? We experimented with expanding window, we decided not to go down uh, that the route, instead we're just gonna stick with the BEA's industry specific depreciation rates, so that's, and we actually done quite a bit of work there. All right, so a little bit more details uh, just to hopefully help establish our incremental contribution at the same time acknowledge our intellectual debt. Lindenberg and Ross, the first paper, okay? Uh, Selingers and Summers being cited quite a bit in this literature because they pretty much were the first to estimate economic depreciation. They were using double declining, Another famous paper by Fazari, Hubbard, and Peterson, they were using single declining. So people have some disagreements about how to estimate economic depreciation. Whole 1990 is the MBER document that's been used a lot among macro economists. But the, what Hall did uh, was basically inflation adjusting net PPE. So she's still using accounting depreciation. So Hayashi Neinu, um, as um, influences us quite a bit. So we in the 2020 RFS paper, Anjay Chen and I thought that we were the first one to use this investment flow. It turned out, it, I just didn't remember that Hayashi and Inu did the same thing, all right? So let me give them credit while well, credit is due. So we're gonna expand on their measurement framework for investment flow. So I have slides coming up on that issue. So they have better quality Japanese data. They have asset specific composition at the firm level. So they are able to construct asset specific depreciation rates, asset specific price deflators and combine them together for firm specific rates. We cannot do that. There's no asset detail, the asset specific data in CompuStat. So we have to make do with the BEA level data set. Tony's job market paper should basically following a Saline and Summers manufacturing firms, only 325 double declining. Uh, Barnett uh, Sakalaris, another famous paper at the Journal of Monetary Economics being cited uh, widely because they were the first one to implement Abel and Alberti's 94 AER paper. So they were basically using horse MBER uh, data set. So Chirinko and Shaler, it's another uh, intellectual debt that we must acknowledge. Um, the basic skeleton of our empirical design follows theirs, okay? But we defer in virtually all the details. So our so their investment flow measure, if you read their data appendix, it's quite a bit convoluted to our liking. So we ended up following Hayashi and Inu. So they calculate sector specific deflators and economic depreciation rates, we're gonna work with industry specific, which is one layer more disaggregate. Uh, they work with trend dollars that are actually not exactly correct because trend dollars are based on trend type quality indexes. They are not the additive. So you cannot add them up in a capital accumulation equation. So we're gonna clean up all these details in our implementation. All right, with all that work, so let me give you a preview of the key results. So um, um, I think pretty much for the first time, I, I'm not aware of the prior for the entire CompuStat universe. So, um, so current cost, what's the current cost investment rate estimated uh, in, our, in our sample? We're looking at the mean of 23.8% per year, this annual data, 
way higher than the median of 13%. Cross-sectional standard deviation averaged over time is 37%. All these estimates are way lower than the accounting um, based historical cost investment rates. So these are change in PBNT plus depreciation scaled by net PBE. The reason is that the current cost capital and the historical cost capital are vastly different. Their ratio on average is 2.1. The median is 1.6. The reason is mostly because accounting depreciation, right, encompass that are way higher than economic depreciation. So we're looking at the 6.9% versus 21%. Also much less volatile for economic depreciation, right? So I have, so two histograms. The left panel is the BA's industry specific economic depreciation assigned using our um, carefully constructed mapping to the firm level. It's not exactly normal distribution, but not that different. Right. Whereas if you look at the accounting depreciation, these are straight line depreciation. Economic depreciation from BA is based on geometric depreciation. Geometric means it's actually a constant. If asset composition doesn't change, it's actually a constant. Whereas accounting depreciation is based on straight line depreciation pattern. Each year, the amount of depreciation amount is constant. But towards the end of the service life for a piece of asset, so, right, the net PP jobs, the numerator stays the same as a result that the fraction, the depreciation rate actually goes up. So that's why you see the long right tail. All right. So, and here is our headline result. So um, this is the firm level current cost investment rate distribution. You see it's a heavy duty asymmetric. So thereby we extend the prior plant level study by Cooper and Healthy Wanker at the plant level using longitudinal research database, right? So at the, for, for establishments, manufacturing establishments, we do the same thing for CompuStat firms. So our key estimates, negative investment rate, this is below minus 1%. We're looking at 5.1, sorry, 5.5%. Positive, this is about 1%, 91.6%. And in the middle, this is the investment rate between minus one and 1% 1 per year. So that's what Cooper and Healthy Wanker define as inactive investment region, right? Inactive investment rates, that's 2.85%. So you look at the massive, magnificent the right tail. So this is asymmetry, right? So that Cooper and Healthy Wanker emphasized repeatedly in their paper, we extend that to compute that firm level. Another indication is spikes. So investment spikes are that basically investment rates that are higher than 20%. So these are big investment projects. So Coupon Healthy Wanker report 18.6% at the plant level, we are looking at the actually higher spike rate, 32.7%. So another um, prominent classic study, the data, data work at the plant level is by Dongs and Dung. So all the um, investment theorists cite these two papers for empirical motivation, Coupon Healthy Wanker and Doms and Dung. So Doms and Dung also work with the balanced panel from longitudinal research database. So a balanced panel, because that's the only way you can construct perpetual inventory. You can apply perpetual inventory. So they rank all the firm's investment in the time series in a descending order. And then they calculate that 50% of investments in the time series for each plan is done within just three years, three out of 16 years of their sample or about 20% of their sample years. So we design a similar diagnostic test. We want, we want to avoid to impose the balanced panel on the complete six decades of CompuStat, right? The, we, we, we feel the sample selection is going to be unbearable. So how do we meet them half, halfway? We split the compute step by decade. But within each decade, we can tolerate the balanced panel. So that's what we did. Okay, Within each decade, uh, we rank each firm's investment by descending order, and we calculate the, what's the percentage of first two years. 
right? It, and then we average across six decades, it turns out 39%, right? So it's lower than 50% at the plant level, but 39% is not the small number either. If everything is uniform, right? So, um, so you shouldn't be seen 39%. All right, so that's in a sense is the 33,000 feet um, overview of the paper. So I'm gonna head into the details. I'm gonna start with the meta analysis on, we're gonna highlight, we're gonna see why is the measurement of investment rate in CompuStat so diverse? if not the messy, right? We attribute the messiness to the macro micro disconnect. It turns out national accounting and financial accounting are just totally different. And we somehow have to live together, all right? And we're gonna make a serious attempt at integrating national accounting at the aggregate level with financial accounting at the micro level. So that's the step two, step three, I'm gonna show you more details of the basic properties. All right, so um, so Bureau of Economic Analysis fixed assets accounts. That's where we grab our uh, macro data. The basic idea, I mean, most people are familiar uh, with financial accounting in CompuStat or any micro level data set. The national accounting works very differently. So macro accounting, ideally, if you have all the data, right, you have each company's um, investment depreciation rate, the price deflators, asset uh, composition, you can just uh, apply perpetual inventory for everybody, every firm, every establishment, and you aggregate everybody up to industry, to sector, and then to the economy, right? But the data requirement, it's insanely infeasible, right? So national accountants, they have to do surveys, they have to cut the costs. The way they do it, they do they, they ask capital goods producing producers, so like how many tons of uh, iron or copper have you sold the last year to domestic buyers? So how many computers have you sold for Dell, for example, right? Um, right, and then, and then that's the aggregated investment for domestic customers, right? Domestic investment. You have to take away government purchases and uh, uh, consumer, me buying a refrigerator, that's personal consumption, doable consumption, not the capital investment. And then you have to distribute investment totals by iron, copper, and computers are different types of equipment. You have to distribute the aggregate investment totals by asset class across industries using like industry level capital flows data. My, based on my reading, I don't pretend I know all the technical details, but based on my reading, so this is a little bit of uh, imputation. If there's any weakness, this is where you should find, should be able to find the weakness because the, the national accounting employment data are of much higher quality quality than capital data at the micro level. So you have to make some assumption like Coppadoculus and use employment data to impute the capital data for each industry. But after that, after all that is done and you can apply perpetual inventory. With that caveat, we're gonna take the BEA data very seriously at the, at the industry level because that's the best we can do. That's the best quality data we can put our hands on. So economic depreciation rate is very different from financial accounting straight lines. So this is a Houghton and the Weekoff. So written in early 80s, they show that economic depreciation is very close to the constant. The geometric depreciation is close to the actual profiles of used capital price decline. So they are following the so-called wealth definition of capital. So we're gonna follow BA. So this, and after 15 years in 1997, BA switched from straight uh, straight line accounting to, to geometric uh, uh, depreciation. We're gonna go with BA. So there are some alternative definition of uh, capital depreciation um, for, for, for time limit I'm not gonna get into. So, but the bottom line is that for our purpose, economic depreciation is calculated this way. B is declining balance rate divided by average service life. And you can estimate average service life as well as declining balance rate. The bottom line is that the declining ba balance rate used in BEA are way below two, especially for structures, 0 0.9, 1.96 for equipment. They're way below Salinger and Summers uh, double declining, which means the balance rate is two. So we're gonna, another reason for us to avoid 
uh, studying and summer's procedure. All right, so a bit uh, background for the literature. So um, pretty much all the investment theorists that I know uh, cite these two papers, Cooper, Healthy Wang, and Doms and Dong. So they work with the longitudinal research database. The sample only ends in 1988 because the Census Bureau stopped collecting data on capital retirements in 87. And after 87, only in like census years, they asked for book equity data, uh, book value, book asset data. So book capital, book value of capital data. So the data empirically, so this literature basically kind of stopped, right? Because there's no data, right? So another reason gives us a motivation to work out all the data infrastructure for CompuStat because CompuStat is one of the very few that I have read about that you can implement the micro level data set, you can implement the perpetual inventory, even for macroeconomists. All right, so here is the essential tension, right? So why there's so much confusion? So this is the essential tension. In national accounting, national accountants based on top-down supply-based approach, economic depreciation is geometric economic depreciation. Financial accounting is firm-based, demand-based, everybody works with straight-line depreciation. For tax purpose, that's different, but for financial accounting, just straight-line, right? So if you take financial accounting, compute that data seriously, net PPE is your capital, right? You can I don't like straight line depreciation anybody any more than anybody else, but if that's the depreciation, net PPE is the net capital, right? But the many studies scale investment or profit using gross PPE or book assets. The reason is that um, financial accounting depreciation rates are way higher than geometric de um, depreciation rates. And therefore scaling by gross PPE and book or book assets bring the basic moments way closer to the BEAs. You see the macro micro disconnect. So, but the scanning by gross PPE or book assets is only an ad hoc temporary fix. The real fix, the long-term solution is to construct the current cost capital stock with economic depreciation rates. And that's what we come in. Okay, so we're gonna, in other words, we're gonna make a serious attempt at integrating national accounting with financial accounting. So the basic idea of uh, uh, the basic idea of um, uh, perpetual inventory has been in the literature for a long time, right? Um, so we're going to defer in many details. We're going to try to heal every cut, you know, no matter how 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 deep or how shallow they are. We're going to do the best we can. We're going to put our hands on all the high quality data we can get, we're gonna somehow combine everything together. We have to make a national accounting and financial accounting mesh together swimmingly, all right? And that's the creative challenge in a sense of speaking. So, so that's capital accumulation in terms of quantities, uh, rewriting in terms of current costs, this is our current cost. In the BEA data set, capital price deflator and the investment price deflator, they are actually different because investment involves newer assets with a different composition than old capital. So we're gonna work with, we're gonna combine both because that's the best data we can get, All right? So to make the recursion start to fly, we need to measure investment flow, price and investment deflators, economic depreciation rates and the initial capital stock to start the recursion, all right? So one thing I wanna point out is that Economic depreciation is quantity. This delta is not in terms of current cost. It's in terms of quantity, fixed cost. If you go to BA data set, they provide, you get confused in a hurry because they provide all kinds of metrics because they, you know, and, and as the end user, we have to be careful uh, in our specific application. Now, all right, here comes an important uh, part, which is uh, how to measure investment. Right, so based on our first meta analysis, everybody uses uh, the most popular measure is capex. Sometimes people add capex minus SPPE, sales of uh, PPE. We're going to argue mm, no. Uh, we're going to argue that uh, we ought to be using Hayashi and Inu. We're going to build on their conceptual framework. So, all right, let me get the control of time. All right, so I need to, I need to, I need to speed up a bit. All right, so uh, first. This slide lists the three accounting identities. 
uh, quite a bit of intricacies in the data. So we're writing a measurement paper, accounting paper, we need to get the numbers right. So net PPE equals gross PPE minus accumulated depreciation. In that CompuStat data, this is about the PPE NT is about the 56% on average of gross PPE. 44% is actually accumulation, accumulated. So this is actually a big stock variable, right? Gross PPE accumulation at a, a quite gross book value of acquired assets, gross value of disposed assets, and uh, and uh, accumulated depreciation. You have you have to add up current period depreciation, and because of pooling of interest, mergers, acquisition, accounting, and sometimes you have to combine the balance sheet of the acquirers and the target, right? So you have to incorporate accumulated depreciation of acquired fixed assets, and and this highlighted term in red is accumulated depreciation of disposed fixed asset. And this is an important point. I'm gonna show you why right here, right? In other words, there are different ways you can measure historical cost investment flow. We're gonna be you following Hayashi and Inu by, by using change of PB and P plus accounting depreciation. Both items have excellent coverage in CompuStep. If like some studies have done in the literature. If you just measure using change in gross PPE, you are actually missing this gigantic piece. Well, gigantic, I mean non-trivial amount, right? I recently got rid of my old Dell workstation. Uh, I bought just bought a new one. So the, the old station cost 18,000. Eight years ago, I kept it for so long for sentimental value until it you know, turns into dust, cannot work anymore. I have to upgrade, right? So, but that's $18,000, that's right there. So if you just look at the PPEGT, you won't find it, right? So in, in fact, that's in the data. Change using change in gross PPE underestimates the investment flow on average by 17% uh, because, uh, because this piece is missing. But this piece is missing. There's no item number in CompuStat for that item, all right? So this is why you have to work with the, the myriad, uh, array. you have to work with, work around the array of data limitations in CompuStat. The basic theory is pretty clear, but the, but the, how exactly you have to work with the data, that's where we're coming. Um, uh, let's see. Right, so, um, so how to measure investment and capital is like a chicken and egg problem, okay? So, so um, again, I don't like accounting depreciation any more, any, any more than the other guy standing by me, right? So I, like everybody else, I find accounting depreciation, straight line depreciation to be, well, not very accurate in terms of economic depreciation, right? But given accounting depreciation, I know PPE and T is internally consistent with that because that's what account financial accountants do to do the PPE and T, right? So, so in other words, I can use accounting balance sheet to back out the investment flow. Then I can combine the investment flow with the higher quality economic depreciation data from BA to construct the replacement cost, the current cost of capital. Right, and that's how we solve the chicken and egg problem, right? Otherwise, it's a big mess. All right. So finally, a lot of people using capex minus uh, SPPE, and we make some arguments that SPPE uh, it's only so capex minus SPPE only goes through the cash flow statement. There are many transactions that don't really involve cash, but at the same time change your capital stock, right? So asset for equity, asset for debt. <laughs> I have some patience with me um, because we are writing a measurement paper. So, um, um, so it's been a lot of fun going through thousands and thousands of pages of national accounting documents and financial accounting textbooks. So um, I, I, I grew up as a theorist in grad school, by the way. So this is all new to me. All right, so sales PP also ignores exchanges of a non-monetary asset. All these things are gonna be, are gonna be ignored and uh, using our balance sheet method. From there, we're gonna capture all that. Although we, it's, no measure is perfect, our measure overstates the, the disinvestment, like re repairment losses, 
uh, they're going to show up in our measure that may not even involve this investment. All right, so capital and um, investment price deflators. So I uh, feel looks like I'm going to be like, um, I probably need the five, 10 more minutes. So yeah, that's fine. So I mean, like we started at five past. So okay, all right. Yeah, I want to respect everybody's time. All right, so capital and uh, investment price deflators. So this is based on our extensive conversation with the PEA staff. So we work with the detailed table, current cost and fixed cost, capital and the investment, right? And that's our calculation. So in some prior studies, people use uh, Chirinko and Shaler, for example, they use chain type dollars. Strictly speaking, they are not the additive. You cannot add them up, right? So, uh, but with fixed cost and the current cost, you can do so, and we can we can we can construct the price deflators this way. All right. So, economic depreciation. We again work with the detailed table, and this is our calculation. Uh, we again because uh, in our even in our current cost accumulation equation, perpetual inventory recursion, depreciation rate is the quantity depreciation rate. So we work with fixed costs. You have to be very careful. You cannot use current costs. Otherwise, that's a mistake, right? So we try to be as um, accurate as we can. So 0 0.5, one half of the investment, because that's BA, BA's way of calculating depreciation amount. So we have to respect the same convention. All right. So um, with all this work, so we're not going to um, take initial value lightly either. So we're going to we're going to we're going to take pain to to build the data infrastructure carefully, even though CompuStat, unlike longitudinal research database, we have no CompuStat has no sampling rotation. Right. Once you are in, you are in unless you get delisted or acquired. Right. So once you are in, you are in, right? There's no sampling rotation. However, left censoring still exists in CompuStat because the first year a firm shows up in CompuStat, the firm may, it's not the IPO year, it's not the birth year, the firm may be in operation for 20 years already, right? So we have to construct a way, um, we have to construct the initial capital stock and our way is to do the perpetual inventory again, motivated, inspired by Selina and Summers, but we defer in many details. The basic moments for the investment rates are actually quite robust vis-a-vis -vis the initial value, but we do observe the initial values are different. For first few observations are different, so we put, we put the careful handling of the initial value as well. All right, so with all that data infrastructure, so let's look at the, look at the properties, the key properties of current cost investment rate. So I showed you the current cost investment rate, the mean and standard deviation and median before, and the I over K, so this is just a real investment rate. We emphasize current cost over real investment, right? So CapEx minus PPE, lower mean, much lower standard deviation, 27 versus 24, which is somewhat surprising to me is that even for capex it's got a pretty high spike rate even a firm just grow organically right as opposed to acquisition external acquisition and all so the spike rate is 27.5 percent although the magnitude may be lower right the spike rate is actually pretty high so the asymmetric investment rate again so i put the slide up again is because i want to compare it with the Cooper and Healthy Wanker uh, histogram. So this is their figure one in the plant level uh, data. So 10.4 versus 5.5, 81.5 versus uh, what we have is 91.6. Uh, so they are asymmetric, right? But if you look at the dispersion, they go from the whole distribution goes from uh, minus 0 0.2 to plus 0 0.8. Well, we go much wider minus 0 0.4 all the way to one point, excuse me, all the way to 1.6. So now the bottom line is that they have huge sample selection issue. They only work with 7,000 balanced, uh, 7,000 plants in a balanced panel because they do not have data for the whole universe up to 360,000 plants, right? 
So they do not have the data. Hypothetically, if you have the data, the dispersion will, the, the, the right tail will be massive, will be extending over my computer uh, screen, right? But the bottom line is that if we call this distribution as asymmetric in Cooper and Healthy Wonker with all their sample selection, uh, we feel fairly comfortable that uh, our distribution with all the data available, uh, we have much less sample selection issue at the firm level, and we can say this is this is this is uh, asymmetric, All right? So, and then we went ahead and uh, did the all kinds of um, robustness analysis, different ways of cutting samples by trying to establish an empirical proposition. So we hate in doing empirical work, and we want to be as careful as possible. Uh, we really dislike surprises. Right, so the first screen we imposed is the big uh, mergers acquisition screen, 15% of current cost capital. So the tail gets thinner, but the skewness actually goes up. The detailed estimates are in the paper. Keep him uh, again, 5%, like we got rid of 18.5% of the firm years. It's pretty heavy cut. The right tail becomes thinner, but the skewness actually goes up. Again, the reason is that skewness is standardized the third moment. The skewness formula has a sigma raised to the power third, the third cubic term in the denominator. So the right tail gets thinner, volatility shrinks, the skewness actually goes up. And this has been a kind of status facts in all the other standard patterns in all the other robustness as well. Um, uh, so get rid of first three years, get rid of the first five years, the tail gets thinner, skewness actually goes up. Small versus big, for big firms, the tail gets thinner, skewness actually goes up. So different uh, sectors as well, industries also, too many to report in my slides, they're in the paper, mining and the information, one tangible, one intangible. Okay, so the results are quite similar. All right, so I showed you the... Um, the downs and down analysis uh, in the paper, we have an alternative test as well uh, by splitting by firm age. We need to somehow control for firm age and that's how we do it. Um, so let me, let me skip the detail in the interest of time. All right, so, all right, so we're almost there. Right, so the difference between current and historical cost investment rates, I showed you the big difference between net PPE and our replacement cost. Surprise, surprise. After all this work, we find out that the PPE GT, gross PPE, is actually not that, that far away from our replacement cost. Big surprise, the hard for the empirical insight, right? With all this work, we're going right back to PPE GT as the scalar. The mean is close to one, although the median is 0.88. The reason is that intuitively, PPEGT assigns zero depreciation rate. However, PPEGT also ignores inflation, right? So if you ignore depreciation rate, put it to zero, you exaggerate your magnitude of capital. But if you ignore in inflation, you, 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 you understate the magnitude. The two the two overlooked ingredients actually go opposite directions. They are not exactly wash. The depreciation rate is on average higher than inflation rate. That's why our current cost capital is a bit lower at the median than PPEGT. So book assets should not be used to scale investment rates. You can see that the, the, the numbers are just one half and 0.4. So bottom line is that um, uh, one last slide before I conclude. Right, so it turns out if you scale our investment by PPEGT, it's actually not too far away from our current cost investment rate, right? So if you are thinking in terms of asset pricing, like return forecasting, we actually recommend using PPEGT as the scaler because national accounting has their standard timing convention, which from financial accounting perspective is actually quite convoluted. Right, I won't get into the details. So, so for the financial accounting data, we know exactly the timing con convention when we're allowed to use our data, right? For national accounting, you never know in real time what data available. 
And we can talk about the magnitude, the volatility, probably. But in return forecasting, you're gonna, it's it's pretty hazardous, uh, potentially misleading if you do that. All right. Okay. So let me conclude. So in this paper, so we build the, uh, we try to measure more accurately the firm level fixed investment rate. The main data work is to construct uh, firm specific current cost capital stocks for the entire CompuStat universe. We are bringing the, the longstanding perpetual inventory literature up to the empirical rigor that we are used to be uh, seeing in the factor investing literature with all the attention to details that we have learned in the past 10 years. And we have characterized accurately firm level investment rate properties. We highlight its symmetry and the lumpiness. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Lou. That was a great talk. So one thing that didn't come out in my introduction is, is you know, when you read Lou's paper, he has like, you know, strengths in so many different areas. So like he does his theoretical work, he brings those theoretical conceptual insights to empirical work. I remember talking to one of his co-authors. So with his RFS paper on anomalies, Lou himself did a year's worth of data analysis for that paper. And I mean, like that, that really shines through here. So there's a lot of grunt work here that needs to be done, but a lot of conceptual understanding required to reconcile, as Lou talked about a lot, you know, economic so, depreciation versus accounting depreciation. Sorry, Lou, I'll pass over, yeah. Sorry, I was just gonna add, uh, thank you, Phil, for the kind words, but a big shout out to Chen Shear. So he's the true hero behind all these papers. Okay. So Chen, my co-author at Cincinnati, is the person who single-handedly coded up replicating anomalies, and oh, uh, he's the driving. Yeah, yeah, he's the he's the driving force behind the uh, behind the construction data work as well. So I must have misinterpreted my conversation with Kawhi. I'm pretty sure he told me that you did it. So sorry, sorry, my mistake. Yeah. I mm. I I did the conceptual work. So okay, um, yeah. My my apologies. Yeah. So I mean, like. I think, you know, we um, we really see that, you know, coming through in this paper is, you know, the willingness to, you know, to get into that data and to produce something like this. And I, I suspect the end outcome is going to be a major service to the profession. So once this data becomes available, I think, you know, people are going to start to use it and it's going to be very, very heavily cited. So thank you, Lou. Thank you, Phil. So should we get to the Q&As? So there's, it says there's two, I don't know if you're happy to read them out yourself. There's two questions, but there's only one. So anyone else, if you'd like to ask questions, please just pop them in the Q&A. All right, I see two Q&As, two, two Q&A messages. I'd like to ask a question about the modeling tax deductibility of depreciation rate. It seems we would need to use two depreciation rates, economic and historical for tax purposes. Yeah, good the question. Oh, sorry, we'll just jump in because she's actually sure. followed that up with the second one. So oh, just okay. Typo. Tax deductibility of depreciation expense. Uh, yeah, my understanding is that um, IRS has a, a depreciation schedule for different assets. So uh, relative to straight line depreciation, IRS depreciation rates are actually accelerated. Uh, so in a sense, it's closer to BA's economic depreciation. Um, um, so though I'm not, we, we spend some time investigating the IRS, IRS rates, but it's actually, uh, we couldn't find the, the large scale uh, depreciation rates that uh, firms actually use for tax purposes in CompuStat or any other sources. Um, uh, it would be something to think about. So we stick with the BEA rates instead, and that's what we end up with. Say if you, okay, I have another message. If you would redo your 2020 RFS paper, would you change the way you model or calibrate? <laughs> Good question. Uh, yeah, so research is such a, <laughs> uh, uh, um, um, sorry, I cannot tell from the, <clears throat> from the name, uh, uh, 
uh, male or female. So, or he or she is she's one of my colleagues. Ah, uh, she's smiling back at me. So, right. So, so good question. So, research is such an iterative process, right? So, um, in the paper, I jokingly talked about, uh, oh, look at the uh, forty investment rates. This look like a giant mess. Right, it was I was try, trying to poke fun at myself as well. So I'm actually one of the messers and one of the messies. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's empirical work to bring theory to the data. It's actually a lot of things you need to worry about. Um, um, so, so what I would do, yeah. So if I were to redo on Calvin's and some paper, I would uh, try out the. Uh, in that paper, we scale using PPNT. We would uh, scale with PPGT and uh, while setting, we still me measure investment in the same way, but uh, in the investment return equation, we're gonna put the depreciation rate to zero, right? So uh, we may even use our current cost capital and the firm level economic depreciation rates developed in this paper, uh, because in the prior paper, we were only matching average returns, right? So we were not forecasting returns to per se, although towards the end of that paper, we did a little bit of forecasting, but that's not the central uh, issue in that paper. We actually have a work in progress. We are starting to see some cool results. Okay, so the fundamental cost, the fundamental cost of capital paper, we're trying to um, uh, push the 2020 RFS line of work further by, by coming up with the implied cost, a fundamental cost of capital measure for X anti expect return measure in order to compete with the implied cost of capital literature in accounting, right? So we are starting to see some cool results and that in that application, forecasting is fairly restrictive. So you cannot use any look ahead information, otherwise it's not credible, right? So we, in that paper, we're using PPE, GT, and we set the accounting depreciation rate to zero in investment return equation, although we are still using uh, PPE NT, the change of that plus depreciation as investment, right? So we're using that to do forecasting in that structural model and uh, some of our results are fairly decent, but it's earlier. We're doing all kinds of double checks, internal checks, internal replications along the way. Thank you, Na. Yeah, Na is one of my colleagues, Lou, and she does a lot of work in the investment space, as you can probably tell from. Um, cool. She's, she's very familiar with a lot of your literature. Cool. The more the merrier. Yeah. All right. Um, Looks like I have another question. Do I? I don't think so. I think. Uh, she, thank you. You're told welcome. Her so far, so. Uh, um, would anyone so else? Have we have 25 participants. Uh, don't be shy. Don't be shy, especially in front of me. So uh, if you want to see how shy I am, go read my blog on my website. <laughs> I love your blog, by the way. So oh, sorry. Oh, that's, um, it's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's just um, um, it, intellectual market such a competitive game. Mm. So, uh, so we're competing with the best of the best. Uh, we feel we have to go out of way to let our opinions known, mm. and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, and it's okay to. I actually encourage people. Thank you. So Tina said, enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I appreciate it. So yeah. So um. So yeah, I don't. I don't mind being criticized. So. Um, right, that's how we learn. So, um, so Luke, can can I ask you a broader based question? So, so given that sure. you've done this paper and you know you've, you've developed you know these new more you know um, better quality investment rates, how do you think these investment rates are then going to be taken to the literature and improve what's already been done in the context that they've been used before? So, I'm not, it touches a little bit on Nas' question, but it's perhaps a little bit broader. Question. Yeah, so I'm pretty hopeful. So with this, like you know, the to executing this paper. So we spent two and a half years to do the painstaking execution, and before that, the six months of uh, reading the literature. So to design the procedure, um, I'm pretty hopeful. 
our investment rate model, current cost, and the capital stock will be used broadly. There are so many ways to use our data, right? So uh, take the famous uh, Peterson Taylor, I think 2017 paper at the GFE, which I'm very fond of. So uh, they were using PPEGT as the scaler and we validate their practice. XND, I would never thought of that, but the, the X post, we end up uh, validating them. But on the other hand, uh, they were looking at, uh, they were not forecasting returns. So it's, it's for perfectly worthwhile uh, to use our replacement cost to redo their analysis. Even their investment flow, the numerator, uh, they were using CapEx. And we have what we believe to be a more accurate measure of investment flow, right? So that's empirical corporate finance and the four for the for the for the macro finance field right so my thesis for example and many other people have worked on the literature over the years i think uh, my sense of the big picture is that this literature in a sense is too is theoretical which is good we emphasize uh, causal mechanisms i've been criticizing uh, six factor model. Uh, sorry, I have to mention that uh, for lack of uh, causal mechanism, for lack of theoretical foundation, right? But uh, but I've learned a tremendous amount from pharma French over the years about empirical rigor. Mm. So you can see what we have learned over the past 10 years from this paper, right? So we can turn around and uh, ask the same thing, just the opposite from the macro finance literature. The literature is not a small any literature anymore, but my sense is that it can be made more impactful uh, if we can clear, if we can improve the empirical rigor. So the perpetual inventory, pretty good ideas, right? But we're not using it the more at uh, the more grand scale. We are being outcompeted pretty badly by straight accounting uh, variables and it's because uh, we a lot of the procedures we are using are not up to the um the the standards uh, among 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 you know in the in the in the factor factor investing world so we can we can bring that literature closer to the data right and some of the predictions can be counterfactual uh, for example and don't pay enough attention to the um, empirical facts, stylized facts, and uh, and I'm working on right. So the theoretical models can be made closer to the moments that our investment rate moments can be used to guide the calibration and further development of the of the theoretical applied the theoretical models. So all these are, uh, are are possibilities. Great, thanks, Lou. That's a great answer. So yeah, I had a feeling yeah. without knowing the literature well that it has a lot of broad based implications. So we've ticked over to 10 o'clock. Um, uh, one more chance for anyone to ask questions. I don't think so, but if anyone does. Okay, I think we're done. Lou, thank you so much again for a really interesting keynote and, you know, wish you well. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. It's been an honor. Thank you very much. I'm very grateful. Please, are you there? So, so I'll yeah. all right, I'll stay on until you ask me to leave. Oh, Liz usually just shuts down the webinar. So she, oh, okay. she must all have right. walked away from the computer. So. Oh, okay. In that case, I'll say ciao then. Okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, we're being recorded. So ciao. Yeah, Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> uh, uh, this is cool. All right. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again in person uh, next yeah, time. Yeah, that would be great. Right. So um, yeah, hopefully yeah. you can come out to Australia sometime. So okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Phil. Bye-bye. Yeah, Liz, are you there? Oh, there we go.